We've often referred to cities like Utrecht and Eindhoven where, when we're talking about vehicle-to-grid infrastructure. But we should also be mentioning Nottingham. Hey, oh, Nottingham! <laughs> Hello and welcome to Almost Breaking News on the Everything Electric channel. Now here's a little juicy something to start us off. If you earned or were paid £40,000, British pounds, a day from the day Jesus was born up to the present day, you would still not make as much money as Shell did in profit last year. No, 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 no. I'm, not, I'm not talking turnover, I'm talking pure profit. And that is what we're up against. Selling oil generates vast, unimaginable wealth. It goes against every human instinct to stop doing that. And yet that is what we are asking these vast, cash-bloated behemoths to do. The Exxons, the BPs, the Saudi Aramcos, the Coke Industries, the Shells of the world have got to stop making vast amounts of money every day. Now that, I think, is quite a big ask. The only thing we can do is stop giving them money by not buying their products, which is very, very difficult. Even if you've got an electric car, everything else around you. We live in a world that is still almost entirely dependent on fossil fuel. But it does put into perspective why there are, why there is enormous energy resources and leverage to slow down the transition away from using their toxic liquid fuels. These companies could easily afford to build vast renewable resources. All it needs is their actual commitment to doing something positive. And I'm not talking 0.005%, which is what they grudgingly throw at it at the moment. I'm talking proper money and possibly some simple government legislation to encourage them. I'm not saying that this is what I'm going to refer to now is government legislation about the fossil fuel industry, but it's government legislation that is encouraging the uptake of renewables. This is what the government have recently done in France. Now, this is a report from the BBC News website, and I quote, In a drive to boost clean energy production, the French Senate recently approved legislation that makes it mandatory, it's the law, for all existing and new car parks with 80 spaces or more have to be covered in solar panels. Excusez-moi, Monsieur Dupont. Uh, que pensez-vous de ce truc solaire de parking? Uh, si un idiot mettait du solaire dans les parkings, ville folle. But just imagine for a moment. Uh, that, that, that every car park in Europe was covered in solar panels. The cars would be kept in the shade in summer, maybe some protection from rain and snow on wet days. The ground is already covered in concrete, so you're not defacing anything beautiful. In fact, you're making it better for everyone. It would look nicer. And who would pay for it? The cash-strapped local council? No. Small companies that have car parks with 81 spaces? No. Central government by putting up income tax? No. What about the oil companies? They could pay for this, but and all it would be to them is a <coughs> clearing their throat. It's nothing to them. Anyway, here's some more solar news in a moment, but this little news nugget just popped up today. What is the world's number one best-selling car? Well, it must be Toyota or VW or Ford, right? It must be a legacy company that's been around for decades and is widely trusted. No. It's the Tesla Model Y. This one single model from Tesla is the best-selling car in the world, from a company that did not exist 25 years ago. The Model Y is not the best-selling electric car, though obviously it is that, but it is the best-selling car full stop. Petrol, diesel, hybrid, forget it. It is outselling everything around the world. That is what technological change can look like. It throws the old patterns and habits and manufacturing systems that we've used to, throws that out the window and starts again. So I want to go back to solar because I love this story. Okay, I love it. Okay, and it's just a story, but I love it. Okay, railway lines. Okay, two long strips of metal rails joined together by sleepers. Used to be wood, <laughs> now concrete, should probably be recycled plastic, and they may well be. So there's a gap between the tracks, a gap that stretches for hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles. It's ground that's already been affected by human intervention, a bit like car parks. You can't grow crops or graze animals on that long strip. Apparently sheep 
and trains at high speed don't mix. It's no use for anything else except... Now, this story from a Swiss news channel caught my eye. Swiss startup Sunways has developed a mechanical system to install removable solar panels, removable, so it can put them down and lift them up along railway tracks. Its creators say the innovation could be adopted on half the world's railway lines. Well, the scarcity of space available in Switzerland makes it difficult to add to, to build large solar installations. In addition, strict regulations on environmental protection and cultural heritage sometimes hinder the installation of solar panels on private buildings, infrastructure and mountain tops. Baptiste Danicher, the co-founder of Sunways, explained solar panels between rails, on the other hand, have no visual or environmental impact. These panels are one metre wide and two metres long. They fit perfectly between the rails. Obviously, one solar panel between the tracks would make no difference. A thousand kilometres of solar panels between the tracks is roughly half a million panels, which would be equivalent to a 450 megawatt solar farm. And it takes up no extra space. There is already electric infrastructure alongside the train tracks. The trains themselves could use the power. It's a win-win all the way to a clean energy future. The only downside, and it's not like that anymore in this country, but, you know, I've used trains around the world. The only downside is if the train uses the old-fashioned toilet facilities. I'll leave that there with you. How many times have we heard, I'd like an electric car, but they can't tow my truly enormous caravan that I have to move one week a year? The other 52 weeks it's stuck right outside the front of my house. <laughs> Sorry, that's, they wouldn't add that second bit. Anyway, what if you want to tow a big caravan? We've heard that quite a lot. I'm going to tell you that. We've heard it quite a lot. Well, solutions to so many of these problems are emerging all the time. What about a 2.5 metre by 8.2 metre self-powered recreational vehicle slash caravan, i.e. a fairly chunky and heavy bit of luxury recreational kit that will not reduce your vehicle's range your electric vehicle's range, actually even your gasoline burner. They always burn way more petrol when they're towing stuff. It will not reduce your vehicle range by one centimetre. Now, we've featured solar-powered campers before on this channel, but none of them are able to move themselves under battery power. This is the Lightship One, and it has an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack. And once you arrive at your camping location, it can provide a week of off-grid power without charging, partly due to the solar panels on the roof. Now, this has been developed by a team in the USA that used to work at Tesla and Rivian. This recreational vehicle can power all the needs of its occupants and eliminates the need, uh, the reliance on propane and other fossil fuels. It's luxury amenities. I mean, we're talking top of the line here. It's luxury amenities are all electric. And OK, it costs an arm and a leg, this thing. But I predict this type of technology is going to become more common. A Swedish company called Einride is developing a large trailer for commercial semi-trucks, or articulated lorries as we prefer to call them, which basically does the same thing, extending the range of the towing vehicle by an enormous amount. Their first generation trailer has a 320 kilowatt hour battery pack and is designed to increase the range of the entire vehicle by as much as 400 miles. So there are so many opportunities in the field of logistics, and it's basically been technology that's been stuck in the past for the last 70 years. Very exciting possibilities as batteries get cheaper, use less rare materials, and last longer and longer. And there's a little, quite big battery story coming up right at the end of this news insert. Next story. <laughs> Now, I've had a few gripes and moans about Toyota in previous news episodes, so I'm going to try and be really positive about this amazing company. I'm quoting from a Reuters report here. Uh, they state that Toyota will introduce 10, count them, new battery-powered models and target sales of 1.5 million EVs by 2026, aiming for steep growth in a market where Toyota has, let's be honest, been left behind by rivals. Now that is interesting, after all the guff we heard about hybrids and hydrogen fuel cell cars. They've just pushed that for decades and now, at last, Toyota have changed course and are going big on battery electric. 
Now, Toyota have acknowledged that EVs are now expected to make up, they've actually said this, expected to make up more than half of total worldwide, worldwide vehicle sales by 2030. Meeting that demand will be critical for Toyota, which also said it would increase the production in the United States, where the growth of EVs is outpacing that of the overall global market. That's interesting in its own. So they'll need to pull their socks up and get on with it because Toyota reported, reported that their US sales fell by nearly 9% during the first quarter of the year. And we're not talking about electric vehicle. This is all the vehicles they make. And they are a huge company. They make a huge amount of cars. And if their sales have dropped by 9% in one quarter, that is bad. By contrast, General Motors saw an 18% boost in the same period, helped by greater demand for EVs from fleet and commercial customers. That's where the money's going. Ding, ding, ding. Hello. Are you ready? So I'm not going to gloat and do a, I told you so. They have, there have been plenty of far better informed and knowledgeable people than me saying this about Toyota for the last five years. I want Toyota to succeed. I want it in the mix. I just hope they can adapt in time. Imagine in a few years time you're driving along the road in an electric car, by then we'll just call it a car, and you see a sign telling you there's a lane ahead which will charge your car while you drive. You indicate and pull over into that lane, you don't slow down, you don't have to do anything but steer, and your car receives extra charge. Crazy pipe dream? Question mark. Well maybe. A few years ago we went to Paris and saw a 500 metre long strip of induction charging plates set into the road that sent power to a Renault van travelling at 60 kilometres an hour. Now this wasn't a fuzzy dribble of the, the odd electron, it was a charging at a full 50 kilowatts, which was the top rapid charge speed at the time and the top uh, charge that that car could accept. So jump ahead six years and once again the Nordic countries are pushing the technology envelope. Sweden is in the process of installing a similar technology on a public highway. Now I didn't know this but they've already got a 2.5 mile stretch between Visby and the local airport in Sweden that was first commissioned back in 2020. So this already exists in the ground. The next step is a 13 mile stretch. 13 miles? Interesting, this report is in miles, not kilometres. Anyway, a 13-mile stretch of inductive charging systems buried under the road surface. You can't see the induction charging system, so it's protected by the road surface. But if your car is fitted with an induction system under the car, basically quite a light, small plate that you'd bolt onto the bottom of the car, it will start receiving a chunky charge, way more than you're using to move along. Now, this is initially being put in there to facilitate longer journeys and smaller batteries for big trucks, but obviously cars could use it too. The idea being that eventually, even if you can charge an electric car at your house, you wouldn't need to stop on long journeys as you'd be charging en route. And in Italy, the Stellantis Group have developed an experimental track in Chiari, Italy. In theory, they are driving a Fiat 500e with literally unlimited range. Uh, what's the range on the uh, Fiat 500e, Sergio? It is uh, unlimited. The car is constantly charging as they drive it around the circuit. This is on a circuit, not on a road. It's not on a pu public road. But it's charging all the time faster than it's using to charge. So you literally could get in that car, forget your bladder, drive it forever without stopping. Now that is beyond the range of boring old diesels. They're also using this track to test long distance trucks and buses. Obviously, that makes more sense. I will remain healthily skeptical about this kind of technology. We've seen it used very successfully in Oslo for charging taxis, but that's while the vehicles are parked and there's less of the, the, uh, the charging plates in the road. There, there isn't that many. When you're talking 13 miles of road or maybe even 100 miles in future, it's a huge, huge logistical sort of disruption. Big, big job, very expensive to put in. Anyway, we'll be keeping our ear to the ground on this and hopefully we'll get the chance to test some of these systems in the near future. We did an episode recently on the Fully Charged channel. Uh, Imogen Bogle went to look at a big Tesla Mega Pack battery near Hull in the north of England. It's the biggest grid battery in Europe. It's quite chunky. It's a grid balancing system that saves the local network from powering up gas turbines during peak demand. Uh, you know, so that is of huge benefit and very, very cost effective. 
It was very well received and most people loved the story, but some men, I have to say they were men, really, were really annoyed as they thought, we thought that if there were enough of these batteries, lithium ion batteries, massive packs, you could run the entire country on batteries for two weeks, or some of them said five weeks. That's how long they wanted it, when there was no wind or sun. The ranting went on and on and on with so much knowledge for complete amateurs on Twitter and YouTube comments. We all knew this was a grid balancing batteries. They make a massive difference to the grid and can be really, and they can really help out in times of hard demand, high, high demand and they switch on instantly, unlike all other systems. So they really do help the grid. They've helped enormously in the United States, in California and in, in Australia. We know from experience that these things work. But what is also important is we are all talking about batteries that exist right now, as if that massive lithium ion mega pack is the final answer. There'll never be any other development. Like battery technology is dead and there's nothing happening. Well, battery technology is developing at breakneck speed. Whatever battery existed yesterday is going to be smaller, lighter, more energy dense, cheaper, and with a longer lifespan tomorrow. So here's a story that's happening right now that could really prove critical in ramping up the growth and reliability of electric ground transport. This story has been widely reported in the press, but this is from The Driven, one of my favourite sites. Chinese manufacturer Gotian High Tech has announced a new battery pack that will go into mass production in 2024. This is the critical thing. Loads of people have developed one little battery that's way, way more energy dense than stuff we've got now but only one. This is going into mass production in China, where they mass produce things. And that says it will deliver a range of up to 1,000 kilometers or 650 miles for a single charge and have a lifespan of powering a car for 2 million kilometers or 1.3 million miles. That's how long the battery will last. The car will have fallen to bits way before that. The company says the manganese doped L600 LMFP Astriono will be able to do 4,000 full cycles at room temperature and at high temperature it'll get 1,800 cycles and over 1,500 cycles of 18 minute ultra fast charging. We're talking 350 to 500 kilowatts to charge this size battery that quickly. To put 2 million kilometers into context, this is from an, av uh, an Australian website remember, to put 2 million kilometers into context, the average Australian car travels around 15,000 kilometers a year. So it would take 130 years worth of average driving to reach the 2 million kilometer mark. When you buy an electric car, how long does it last? About 130 years. Can we shut up about diesel being more efficient? Oh God, finally, this is all I've been waiting for. I just wanna live long enough. To, so that I can just be right about how utterly unpleasant diesel cars are. God, the amount of people who, who go, my diesel does this many, I don't give a toss about your filthy old diesel. Keep it, don't get rid of it, keep it, drive it till it falls to bits because your next car will be electric with a thousand kilometers of range and it'll last 130 years. Let's move on. We've often referred to cities like Utrecht and Eindhoven where, when we're talking about vehicle-to-grid infrastructure and improving air quality in urban areas. But we should also be mentioning Nottingham. Hey, oh, Nottingham! Yep, they have long been promoting electric ground transport. I've been there, it's amazing. They've got lovely trams and loads of car charging and they loads of electric cars and they're putting their muscle where their mouth is. The city council now have a depot just outside the city centre where they can charge their fleet of 250 electric vehicles, including six electric bin lorries or garbage trucks. That's impressive. That's impressive enough. But now they've gone one step further. They've just finished installing 40 vehicle to grid charging points as part of their clean mobility pilot. These are supported by a large solar array and a 699, not quite 700 kilowatt hours, 699 kilowatt hours of battery storage. The battery being made up of 24 old electric vehicle batteries. Now this pilot scheme was funded by Innovate UK and the European Union. Yes, that's right, the EU which Britain voted to leave, particularly people in Nottingham, voted to leave seven years ago. So I don't quite know how that came about, but I think the people of Nottingham should be very grateful. Whatever, 
What this whole system does, apart from help with load balancing on the local grid, is ensure that the maximum amount of clean, locally generated electrons can be used to charge all the council's vehicles. This is really impressive stuff, and we've long been aware of Nottingham's plan to become the first carbon neutral city by 2028. So come on your other cities around the world, check out what Nottingham are up to and get moving. We don't have time to hang around on this. And I don't have time to sit here waffling all day, but let me just say this as I sign off. Wouldn't it be incredible if one of the big oil companies supported a scheme like this, not with a token million dollars and loads of greenwashing PR that probably cost three million. Let's not say that. Let's say, what about four billion dollars to help totally decarbonise one European city to see and, and, and to test out how it could be done? Four billion dollars is just over one month's profit, so they really can afford it. That's all. Subscribe, like, tell your mates, and if you have been, thank you for watching.